friends, peace be with you. Today is a good day to breathe, and I'm going to invite us to celebrate that spiritual practice together. It is a spiritual, it is a biological, it is an emotional practice. And I'm just going to invite us to take a moment, check in with the temple for the Holy Spirit that we celebrate in our tradition is our own body. That should blow our minds for a moment. Recognize and welcome the Holy One to be with you and in you and in this gathered community now. So take a few breaths in and out, check in with your body, recognize God in this place here and now. Take some breaths at your own pace. And again, peace be with you. Friends, be most welcome in this place where two or three are gathered in sanctuaries physically located here, physically located where you are streaming with us online, there is a promise of God's presence to be realized, to comfort, and to challenge. May we leave our worship together today comforted and challenged as we are in need. It is good to be together today. Thank you for taking the time in the midst of your day, in the midst of your week, to be a part of this community. If you are here for the very first time, may it not be your last time. We're grateful that you are with us. We are grateful that you you are bringing your perspectives that are different than those of us who have been here before. And we ask that you would experience the hospitality of Christ while you are here. If you'd like to know more about who we are as a community of faith here at Church of the Covenant, there are a few ways to do so. You can go into your bulletin Online, there's one in the chat in front of you here. There's a physical one in the back. If you didn't get it, you can click on a QR code there, which will get, in touch, uh, get you in touch with me, and I'll get back to you with more information about who we are as a community of faith. My name is Rob. And if you also would prefer to fill out a card in your pew, you can do that as well. I want to lift a few announcements for the life of the community today. There's some things happening uh, here in our, in our midst, in our week, that we as a spiritual community rely on to ground us and to center us and to help focus us. So this today after church, uh, our, I would ask that you would pray for our Climate Jubilee team that is hosting a special lunch for other churches in downtown Boston, their leadership around climate justice. I think it's a, a, a wonderful time for that gathering. So that's happening in Bates Hall at one o'clock. Pray for that. Uh, those of you who are a part of it, thank you for your leadership. Uh, This coming Wednesday, there are two points of connection. There's our morning Bible study at 945 and our evening prayer at 6 o'clock. Both of those are on Zoom, fully accessible. If you have any questions about how to access those, there's details in the bulletins, or you can speak with any of us. I thank you to our ushers this morning. I see Trudy and Denise. Thank you for stewarding things. If you have any questions, you can speak to them. I want to thank Sid Smith for being here, subbing in for Jesus Vargas, who is on a much-needed vacation today. Thank you, Sid, for being our Sunday sexton. And I am really grateful for young Fan, who is here in place of Tom Handel, as he can get a vacation. Thank you for being our organist this morning. Welcome, and we are grateful for your leadership and your musical gifts that are going to center us today as well. Those are some of the things that are happening. There are other announcements in your bulletin, including an upcoming book study uh, led by our Climate Jubilee team, which again will, I think, lift some wisdom for us. So please take a look at those things, and I have one other announcement I'm going to lift up. Did anyone else have an announcement for the life of the community? Before I I lift my last one, Diane, I welcome you as our digital minister this morning. For those in the sanctuary, you'll you'll notice that she is here. When I first came to church, I looked at the screen, and I saw Diane on the screen, and I said, oh, good to see you, Diane, and then she said, I'm actually sitting here as well. So so Diane is our digital minister for us. Diane, can you you unmute and let us know who might be joining us this morning on? Yeah, it's nice to be here in person as well as on screen today. We have 15 people um, online today. Friends, be most welcome. Thank you for taking the time. If you have a candle that you can safely find to light during the service, that's the spiritual practice we invite people to do. Uh, Those in this sanctuary, you get to lean into the candle that we're going to light later. Lastly, I want to introduce to you, if you don't know him, uh, Rabbi Michael Shire, who is here, uh, Central Reform Temple's rabbi, just down the street, our closest neighbor in faith from the Jewish tradition, is right down the street, 15 Newbury Street. We welcome you, Michael, just joining us today in in, in worship and solidarity. It's really good to have you. Uh, For those on the Climate Jubilee team and others, you may have recently met him uh, under the sukkah 
uh, on Sukkot uh, as we leaned into uh, justice around climate in an interfaith way uh, as we were welcomed into that wonderful spiritual tradition of our Jewish siblings. So we're grateful for you, Rabbi Michael, for being with us. Friends, I would invite us to rise uh, as you hear this collect today. Please, as you rise, you can rise on your feet or in your heart as you are led. And I want you to hear this from St. Teresa. Just for today, what does it matter, O Lord, if the future is uncertain? To pray now for tomorrow, I am not able. Keep my heart only for today. Grant me your light just for today. All of God's children said together. Amen. And now we call ourselves into worship as is printed. Loving God in the range of our emotions, meet us. In our fatigue, rest with us. In our anxieties, calm us. In our angers, wrestle with us. In our confusion, counsel us. And in our rising, transform us. In our advocacy, amplify us. In our hopes, sustain us. And in all things and in all places, O loving God, bring your fierce movement of love. Amen. If you're at home now, you can kindle a candle here in this sanctuary. We will do so. And this is also a ritual. It is a symbol and it is a sign. It is a sign that God's presence illuminates that which seems uncertain, a bit gloomy at times, and unclear. We, friends, in our tradition, name this candle as the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Our opening hymn this morning is found in your black hymnal, hymn 436, your black new century hymnal. It's also printed in your bulletin, God of grace and God of glory. I invite you to sing as you are led.
Amen, and please be seated. Harry Emerson Fosdick wrote that hymn in the 1930s, and he knew our moment all too well. We are surrounded by evil, by division, by betrayal, injustice, exhaustion, and fear. As we see these painful realities in stark relief in the wake of the election, we need to open ourselves to honest reflection. Saying the words that are attributed to Nels Ferre that are printed in your bulletin. Would you join me? Come, O Holy Spirit. Come as Come holy, fire holy fire and burn, and burn us. us. Come, Come as holy, as holy wind, wind and, and cleanse, cleanse us. us Come as holy light and lead us in the darkness. Come as holy truth and dispel our ignorance. Come as holy power and enable our weakness. Come as holy life and dwell in us. Convict us, convert us, consecrate us until we are set free from the service of ourselves to be the servants to the world. Let us now open ourselves to God in silent prayer. Amen. Would you join me in the assurance of God's grace? As we emerge into the place of restoration, let's pray with the words of poet Christina Rossetti. As the wind is your symbol, so forward our goings. As the dove, so launch us heavenwards. As water, so purify our spirits. As a cloud, so abate our temptations. As dew, so revive our languor. As fire, so purge our dross. And as a people liberated, let us celebrate together. In Jesus Christ, we are set free and made whole. Alleluia. Amen. Today we have three readings from our sacred scriptures. The first is a responsive reading from Psalms 46 and 42. I will read the lines that are not in bold and invite you all to join me in the lines that are in bold. Let us pray these psalms as they are printed now responsively. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, Therefore we, we will, will not fear, fear. Though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. God utters God's voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Rachel, Leah, Bilhah, and Zilpah is our refuge. Deep calls to deep at the thunder of your cataracts. All your waves and your billows have gone over me. By day God commands steadfast love, and at night God's song is with me. 
prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise God, my help and my God. Our next reading comes from the book of Esther, chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai, so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasures treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and charge her to go to the king to make supplication to him and entreat him for her people. Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a message for Mordecai, saying, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if anyone goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. I myself has not been called to come into the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at a time such as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your fa father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Our final reading comes from the gospel according to John chapter eight, verse six. They said this to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. God is still speaking the word of God. Friends, with the words of Romans lifted before our ears, let love be genuine, hate what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. I just invite you into a word of prayer with me now. Holy and loving God, take our minds and think with them. 
take our lips and speak with them, take our hands and work with them, and take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and all of creation. Amen. We are in a drought here in Massachusetts. Liz knows that, uh, stewarding our public gardens. It's a challenge. We need some more water. And right now, one of the hardest things for, for many of us is you can't have campfires. You can't have uh, little fire pits outside. Last night, our presbytery gathered with our youth in our GLOW movement, and they couldn't have a campfire. They had to move inside the Burlington Church building to have a, a, a semi-campfire indoors because of the fear of wildfire spreading. One of my favorite memories from running a camp up in New Hampshire for many years was singing outside around a campfire, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. This praise song from the 1980s has caught fire, not just in the Christian tradition, but in the Jewish tradition and perhaps others. This past week, when I was invited to gather with GBIO clergy two days after the election, there, lifted by one of our beloved rabbis, was, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary in English and in Hebrew. I was very deeply moved by that. Prepare me, my heart, to be pure and holy for you, O God. Make me ready for your presence so I can love others. So I feel like we should be invited to a campfire right now. I feel like that seems appropriate. I think s'mores are, should be brought here to church right now. Let go of your bulletins and find a marshmallow and maybe some dark chocolate, not just the Hershey's type, some graham crackers. We need a good story. I want to gather us around a campfire and not spread wildfire, but, but grab uh, and spread some good news hopefully around this campfire. So today, I would like us to lean into a great story in our scriptures given to us from our Jewish friends and siblings. The story, wait before I tell you, trivia, what two books in our scriptures are named for women? Esther and Ruth, y'all are good. Esther and Ruth, okay? So this is one of those. It is a full book in the Bible, it comes after Ezra and Nehemiah in our tradition, right before Job and then Psalms. So if you have your Bible, you can flip open to uh, the middle of the Bible and flip back a little bit, and you'll find Esther. It's about 12 chapters. There's some canonical, deuterocanonical versions of it that add some chapters. But what we know of is this story. Today, we heard one chapter from that. I would love for us to lean in to this story today. I think there may be some granting of wisdom, granting of courage for us from this story. So once upon a time... There was a king. Right off the bat, I want to apologize for that word king. Maybe a little triggering for us as we begin today with thinking about absolute control and consolidated power and sovereignty over others. But listen, stay with me here. Once upon a time, there was a king. The king's name was Ahasuerus, a, a very challenging name for me to say. So from here on out, we're going to call him the king. This king ruled the first Persian Empire around 500 BCE which consisted of some 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia, most likely Xerxes I, the Great. This was following the Jewish exile in Babylon. And one day, this king decides, you know what? I am rich, and I want other people to know that. So as a king, what you do when that is the case, you throw a party. And there was kind of 180 days lead up to this party, and then there was a seven-day Focus, a huge party for seven days because he wanted people to know how, how rich he was. So it was lavish. It was full of food and wine. And it says in the, in the text that there were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and colored stones. And drinks were served in golden goblets. Drinking was by the flagons without restraint. This was a serious rager. So on the seventh day of this party, the king decides to summon his wife, Vashti the queen, to show her off as one of his many riches. Pause right there and see the patriarchal misogyny meter flipping into the red. Deeply unsettling, and it gets worse. The king summons Vashti and says, Queen, come, wear your crown and come show your beauty off to my guests. And some biblical scholars interpret this to mean literally Vashti, come wearing only your crown. Before you walk away 
and stop listening to this story to chalk it up as one more biblical example that sanctions men telling women what they can do with their bodies. Check this out, what happens next. Vashti, does she say yes to the king who might kill her if she says no? No, she says, no way. I am not coming. She obeys with disobedience to him and his objectification. I think this is a powerful no in our scriptures. So the king, in his cowardice, in my opinion, gets very angry. And instead of going to confront her, he goes and gathers his men, his, his, his counselors, and says, what am I to do? My wife has said no to me. His advisors blow off his own marital concern and says, king, we have no comfort for you because there is something far more dire at stake here. Not only has your wife done something wrong to you, but she's done something wrong to all men everywhere. For what in the world will happen if women hear this and begin to do whatever they want opposed to what their husbands want? Chaos, calamity. So, the king is very frightened and listens to the counsel of these also offended and scared men. And they say to the king, it's time to take to royal social media. It's time to put out a decree to all the 127 royal provinces to spread the vile misinformation that every man should be master of the house. And I have to say to you all now, pausing, that message is still alive and well in our world and lifted through Christian tradition again and again. I would call it a deep heresy, but this is one of its origin stories. And so as a result of this decree, Vashti is relieved from her duties from the palace. She is not killed. She is let go. And I would say she is liberated, but this is one interpretation. And so the king says, well, I need to find another wife. And so he summons all his counselors to go out to the whole kingdom and find suitable potential wives. And this is where we first meet Esther. She is brought to the palace as people noticed how beautiful she was. She is an orphan Jew who is being raised by her uncle, Mordecai. And court officials put her through a beautification cosmetic treatment that lasts not a day or a week. It lasts an entire year. I have no idea what's going on here. It's a biblical justification for spa day. I'm not sure what's happening. It seems like there's probably some other stuff going on here, but myrrh and perfumes. And finally, after this treatment, Esther is brought before the king, who is super wowed by her beauty, and so he names her as his queen. However, she does not bring her full self to the, to, the, to the throne, right? She retains inside her Jewish identity as guided by her uncle, lest some danger befall her. So in order to keep an eye on Esther, Mordecai frequently hangs out by the outside palace gates, and one day he overhears some people talking about wanting to assassinate this king. And Mordecai then runs to the court officials, tells them, they end up saving the king's life, and Mordecai is lifted up and honored in this way. And people have good vibes for him and all over the kingdom, except for one person, another character named Haman. Haman was a very powerful, close advisor to the king, and he was not excited when other people, other men especially, got attention. So he was not very happy about Mordecai. And Haman was a very arrogant, self-focused person and had this strange fascination with other people bowing down to him. And so when he walked outside and saw Mordecai at the gate, uh, Mordecai did not bow down to him. He only would bow to Yahweh, his God, and he did not. He refrained. So this really enraged Haman. And instead of striking Mordecai down, he thought something more nefarious, more narcissistic, more violent. And as is often the case with similar people who are self-absorbed and narcissistic, especially men, in cowardice, he retaliates. This retaliation was to come up with an entire plan to eliminate all the Jews in Persia at the time, to deny, deport, destroy all women, children, young, old, all men, everyone, all genders in his kingdom. To do this of the Jewish faith. To do this, he began spewing misinformation and lies once again, uh, through the social medias of the time, and said to the king, you, you need to, uh, he said to the people that there are people in your kingdom who do not keep the king's laws and should no longer be tolerated. Haman sent a royal decree by horse and rider throughout and said that there are enemies from within. 
and they need to be utterly destroyed. They are no longer true Americans. Sorry, they are no longer true uh, people in the kingdom. They need to be routed out. And this message to all the cities uh, was that on the 13th day of the 12th month, uh, the month of Adar, at an appointed time, all people were to rise up and strike down all the Jews to plunder them their goods. For what began as pure revenge from a perceived public insult of Haman quickly morphed into a wild scheme to gather wealth that could then be brought back into the royal coffers. We can think 1921 Tulsa's block, Black Wall Street race massacre and many other sad examples in today's world. So Haman's misinformation campaign came with lies and vitriol and worked really well. People started to prepare for this great day of evil, seemingly without questioning what was afoot. And so the story gets to the part in chapter 4 that we just heard Liz read so well. Mordecai hears about this coming great day of evil, and he becomes deeply distressed. With sackcloth and ashes, he descended into public mourning right in front of the palace gate. And he sends words to Esther. She must do something to help. She must go and speak to the king and put a stop to this coming pogrom. Now, there are three reasons why Esther pushes back a little and says, I do not think this is a good idea. The first being, as earlier described, 500 BCE Persia was not a very woman-centered societal setting. In fact, the only time a woman would be able to see or speak to the king is if they were summoned, including the queen. Going unsummoned had serious consequences. One could be killed. Two, Esther thought that criticizing the king's closest advisor and friend might not be the wisest move. It might also backfire. And three, maybe most importantly, the, the reason she held back is that by, by speaking up, she would have had to expose herself as a Jew, something that could have also dire consequences. She had been living safely and had attained a position of power, and so coming out could be very dangerous. And this is where we get to that famous line that probably many of us know and are familiar with in the book of Esther, where Mordecai responds to Esther saying, who knows, perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Now, this powerful prophetic line convicts Esther, and she immediately summons her entourage to fast and pray with her for three days and with Mordecai. And then, seemingly emboldened with those, those prayers and that fasting, she does not immediately run to the king and, and plead dramatically that there is a destructive plot against her people. No, she very much plays it cool, and she approaches the king and says, King, hey, any chance you'd be willing to come to my palace tomorrow for a meal? I'm here to cook for you, which is a good strategy probably for anyone you disagree with to, to prepare some food, a biblical rationale perhaps for vegan potlucks at this church uh, as we think about how to move forward. The night before the king went over for this meal, he agreed. He did not strike uh, Esther down, thanks be to God. He said, yes, I am hungry, I will come. But the night before, the king got hit with insomnia. We've all been there, and even royalty gets hit with insomnia. And so he does something that probably many of us would not. He does not open up his iPad or a book. He summons his lackeys to come to him to read the court records to him. So this would be like us calling up Trudy Veldman and saying, Trudy, at 3 in the morning, could you come over and read the council minutes for me? I can't fall asleep. He summons these folks to read. And when they read it, they come to the part where Mordecai, had saved the king from assassination. And so he said, wait a sec, that was a great thing. I like this guy. Did we honor him yet? And, and people said no. So then he comes, summons Haman and he says, Haman, what should we do to someone who honors me? And Haman, of course, only thinking about himself, says, well, king, I got a list for you. You should, you should get him some new clothes. You should get him a new ride, a new horse. You should put a parade together for him. And, and the king says, perfect. Haman, can you go ahead and do all that for Mordecai? And Haman is... Beside himself, he follows the king's command lest he get killed and is humbled and humiliated. And after doing all that for Mordecai, runs home, yells at his wife, and immediately goes into his backyard and builds a gallow to hang Mordecai the next day on. So the next day, Haman and the king come over to that banquet with Esther. And after much good wine and food, just at the right time, Esther summons that wisdom and courage, and she speaks directly to the king. King, I am troubled, and so should you be, for you are about to lose a huge amount of faithful and loyal subjects, 
and I am one of them. These are my people. And the king immediately is shocked and angry and says to his beautiful queen, as he often refers to her, Esther, what is going on? Who has summoned this? And she points to Haman. The king, in his rage, with irony filled in this great story, orders Haman to then be hung on the very gallows that he had made for Mordecai. The king then goes to social media and sends a decree saying, ignore the false misinformation and lies that you have heard from Haman. Instead, let us celebrate the Jews who are a part, an essential part of our community. Now, there are a few troubling verses at the end of this book that contain some references to Jews going, going out with senseless violence to kill those who were planning to do them harm. Some scholars are a little unclear the origins of those. But the point here, the main point in this ending of a story is a word of deliverance. Good triumphs over evil someday. And Mordecai drinks a lot and dances around a lot at the end and there is a connection, and forgive me Rabbi Michael, you know this far better, there is a connection, a direct one here to the Jewish festival that is still celebrated, Purim, where the Talmud commands that observants drink and dance around and celebrate and remember someone standing up to violence and an eradication of God's people. I really like this story of Esther. And while there are some troubling aspects, misogyny, violence, and vengeance, I am very glad it is part of our sacred canon. Another trivia point to make about this book is that, like one other book in our scriptures, it does not mention God at all. Some, just like the Song of Songs, these two books don't mention God, and yet there is a filled implication of living into God's ways in these texts. But it also calls us to think, where is God in the midst of these things? Where do we find courage? And lest we say too much to ruin a good story, I want to remind ourselves that this story speaks some wisdom and courage to us following the unsettled nature of our week. Now, I in no way presume to think how you voted, who you voted for, whether you voted or not. There is no question, though, in our country there is pain, there is division, and there is hurt, there is exhaustion. So I want us to imagine ourselves in this story. Perhaps today you find yourself with Mordecai outside the gates, stunned and sickened, covered in sackcloth and ashes. The weight is too much, the exhaustion too much, the fear too much. So hear this today if you are. That is okay. There's a place for you in the holy story. Sit with Mordecai, lament, cry out, reach out, find others who are also in pain outside the gate. There is a place for you. Perhaps you might find yourself with the up to chapter 4 Esther, locked in a closet of silence, fearful of letting your true self be known or seen because the stakes seem too high. If so, hear this. That too is okay. You are a part of this sacred story. Join Esther there. Keep a silent vigil. I know of friends who, I know a specific friend in Florida who had voted a certain way and most of her friends voted a very different way. And when she shared how she voted this week with some of her dear friends, they, she was yelled at. She was scared by this. So she is now trying to find a peace in that place of silence. That holy silence, that safety-keeping silence. There is a place for that. There is a time for that. Now, there is a sacred time also to find yourself moving toward speech. So perhaps you're drawn more to the side of Mordecai that holds nothing back, pleads with those in power to act. Act now. If so, hear this too. It is okay. There's a place for you. And maybe you find yourself also with Queen Vashti, who finds her power and her liberation in that strong word, no, to empire's demeaning demands. It is okay too. You have a holy place in this story. Finally, I wonder, you might find yourself asking the question, what would it be like, what would it feel like to join Esther in a true coming out into the full, true self, speaking truth to power? It may not be yet. It may feel too soon for you. But that image of empowering and imagining speaking fully into your fully self, your, from your fullest self to a place for justice might be an intriguing place to think. 
So a word that if you are one of our beloved LGBTQ people, if you are one of our beloved black, brown, indigenous people, if you happen to be born in another country, if you are disabled, if you are experiencing any form of societal marginalization or judgment in the midst of this country, however you voted, hear this. This story reminds you there is power in you. You are made in the very image of God. And Esther's affirmation that you have been made for such a time as this may very much just be the Spirit's whispering into your ear that you have a sacred role in this story and God is not yet done with you yet. There is Spirit-infused power with people standing proudly into their truth selves and it is our job, just like Mordecai, to help others find those safe places to come into the light. For in order to face the king, Esther finds deep wells of unknown courage from her prayers, her fasting, her relationship with Mordecai, someone who believed in her. So we should note those ingredients. For such a time as this, as a divine refrain, gives us people and spiritual practices to hear that and know when it is time and when we are called to speak and when we are called to to be silent. So right now, I ask that us not to move fast from any part of this story, from one part to another. Land where you do land. Understand as our sacred reckonings process teaches us that we are called to move at the speed of trust. Trust in relationships, trust in community, trust in the linkages between Mordecai and Esther that are an essential part of the bending work toward liberation. All of this, church, takes time. All of it is challenging. And yet the, the braiding of relationships, one after another, becomes stronger and stronger, even when they are tested and tried. So I want to leave, leave us with one of my favorite images of Jesus. When he is faced with the powers of misogyny and hatred served up by religious leaders who come to him after setting up a woman and claiming that she is an adulterer. They throw this woman before Jesus. And what is the first thing he does? He does not strike back. He does not speak up. He, reminds, he remains silent. But he takes his fingers and places them into the earth. And he doodles in the sand. He doodles in the dirt. He switches the focus of violence to wonder. One of my activist friends this week lifted up the words of Brian McLaren, who had been lifting up the words of Valerie Coor, who had been lifting up the words of Dr. Martin Luther King from 1956 in his great speech. Uh, a time such as this, sorry, the birth of a new age. All of those have repeated the refrains from time and time again that when something is trying to be born, something also dies. There is labor before the birth, there is a pushing, and there is a liberation. And in this, my friend lifted that when she was pregnant, she felt a deep desire to go outside and just put her hands in the dirt. And it really grounded her quite literally. And the next day, she gave birth. And she really found that the earth had something to teach her about the ways of moving forward and bringing new life. So friends, I would invite us into that spiritual practice that Jesus teaches us. We don't have to know the answers. We don't have to have all the words. We may remain silent for a, a time, for a lifetime, or for a short time. We may know when to act or when not to act. But remember our traditions. Remember the earth. And I am so grateful for this next hymn, which was also sung by someone named Martin Luther, not the king, but the, the reformer. And he spoke about this reality, that there is a mighty fortress named our God, a bulwark never failing, our present help amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe with craft and power great and armed with cruel hate on earth without an equal. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God has willed the truth to triumph through us. The powers of evil grim, we tremble not for them. Their rage we can endure for lo, their doom is sure. One little word shall fell them. That word beyond all earthly powers forever is abiding. The spirit 
and the gifts are ours, for Christ is with us siding. Let's good, let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth shall triumph still. God's reign endures forever. So friends, let us be brave Esthers. Let's be Mordecai's to each other. And let us say to ourselves and one another, you were made for this. You have dignity. You are loved. God is present with all. Amen. I invite us to sing as is printed your hymnal lists, your bulletin lists, the hymn number as we have been led. I invite you to stand now. It is also printed the words in your bulletin.
Please be seated. We welcome Holly and Anita forward for our moment for generosity. Hey Holly, this is stewardship season. How about joining me to discuss something both terrifying and boring? Terrifying and boring at the same time. Could that be politics? Oh, talking about end of life issues is scary for many people. And then you add money to the conversation. We make it scary and boring. You must be talking about writing wills. I think this is the time where we have to say, neither of us is a lawyer, and we don't even play them on TV. <clears throat> so this is not legal advice. It's our own personal experience. Do you remember when we started talking about revising our wills? Yeah, it was a few years ago, and we kept putting it off. Who wants to discuss preparations for dying when we've got so much going on in our life? Besides, we both hope that our own deaths will be a long time in the future. It was a discussion that was easy to put off. Then after our friend Marie passed away, we realized that it was time to get serious about our wills. We had wills from years ago, but we needed to revise them. It's about making sure that our wishes are carried out instead of leaving it up to the state when we're gone. Yes, we started with our values, which make it a different sort of conversation. We both value looking after family and supporting organizations that we believe in. We wanted to make sure that our families had assets after our passing, so we started with each other, recognizing that our spouses would need assets after our deaths. Watch out, this could get scary again. But it's really about valuing each other and wanting what is best for each other, especially for us. Our marriage is legal in Massachusetts and now recognized federally, but we don't take that for granted. So we made each other our first beneficiaries. Then we considered our family members. We want to provide for them through succeeding generations. So where does the church come in? We value our connections to this church, so we wanted to specify Church of the Covenant in our wills, as well as some favorite charities. We could have made it a specific <coughs> amount for the church, but for greater flexibility, our lawyer recommended making our donation a specific percentage of our estate. Our values align with this church. We value our community and we want it to extend into the future even after we're gone. We value the emphasis placed on care for the earth and seeking justice. We value our relationship with our sister church in Nicaragua. We value the beauty of this sanctuary, the Tiffany windows, and the wonderful music that fills this space. We value the community of Christian caring that is embodied in this congregation, <coughs> which we hope will continue far into the future. So this discussion is about values and the future, much more than death and money. Our predecessors invested in Church of the Covenant. We are beneficiaries of their generosity. Now it's time for us to step up. We invite you to consider your own values. How do you want your assets used in the future? Are you brave enough to have this conversation? If you want to consider your values in the future, please make your will and consider naming Church of the Covenant in your will if you value the future of this faith community. Please make a generous pledge to our church when your pledge card comes in the mail. And for more information about wills and end-of-life decisions, check out the Church of the Covenant 
Deacon's End of Life Guide. We promise it's not too scary. You know, when Martin Luther wrote that hymn, one of the lines he wrote was, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. The good news is that we don't have to rely on our strength alone. We're together as a community, bringing our gifts together to do more than any one person can do alone now and into the future. So no matter what you bring, it's enough. You can give online, as indicated in the bulletin or in the chat, or you can respond as our ushers come now to wait on us. God, we thank you for the generosity with which you have blessed us and for the divine spirit that flows through these gifts to our community and the world. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, it's our spiritual tradition to pray together when we come together. We lift prayers in the forms of celebrations and concerns and everything in between. And if you have one, to share, we invite you to raise your hand and we'll pray with you after you share a prayer by leading us by saying, God, in your grace, and we together can pray. Receive our prayer. We'll pass the mic in this sanctuary. We'll pass the mic online. And you can also place a prayer into the chat online. For today, we celebrate birthdays. I think that's a good thing. We're going to celebrate those who are having a birthday this coming week. Those that we know about and those that you don't hear, you're going to then share with us that are not in this book. So I know of, on the 11th, Kelsey Lawhorn, 
And on the 16th, Rich Jackson and Elaine Sullivan, who share that holy day together on the 16th. And Nicaragua, also on the 16th, it is Mana Betancourt. Are there other birthdays coming up this week that people want to share? All right, y'all, happy birthday. You reflect God back to us, and a birthday is a, a time for us to remember and celebrate that. So blessings, God, in your grace, receive our prayer. Friends, let's share other prayers that we want to lift before the body, before God, together. If you have a prayer, raise your hand. Just share your name with us so we can pray with you and, and just speak clearly into the mic. Hello, my name is Liz, and I would like to share both a celebration and a concern. And the first celebration is for your inspired and wonderful and delightful and, and supportive sermon this morning, Rob. That was amazing. My concern, um, you may have read this week about a uh, text that went out to um, black students throughout the country that the FBI is investigating high school, college, graduate school. Well, one of them uh, um, asking, threatening these people, um, saying that you uh, need to show up for a plantation, that you are now slaves. I mean, it was very, very scary stuff. And one of my uh, staff members, nephews, was one of the recipients of those texts. And she came in very, very distressed the next day. So I'd like to pray for support and protection for all of those who have been targeted this week. We amplify that prayer and we pray for uh, a cessation, a full stoppage of any such further harm. God, in your grace, receive our prayer. Yes, my name is Tim, and I want to uh, celebrate in particular the wonderful uh, organ music that our guest organist, Ms. Shu, has, has given us today. And I particularly am amazed to think about the two composers, Johann Sebastian Bach and Felix Mendelssohn. And um, Betsy and I had a chance to be in their church in Leipzig, Germany in June with the Bach Fest and Emanuel Music. And um, we learned there that Felix Mendelssohn, came, coming 100 years later than Bach, was the one who insisted that that church revive Bach's music. Up to that time, Bach had pretty much faded into obscurity. And it's hard to imagine now, but he had. And Mendelssohn said, you cannot ignore this man's music or any of the music of the past. And he reintroduced it to the Lutheran church where he was the organist and choir director. Uh, a few years later, in the 1880s, uh, Leipzig was renovating that church. A lot of new things going on in Leipzig and improvements. And um, the congregation there was going to do a window for Bach and Mendelssohn. And the, the, tone, the tenor, the anti-Semitism in Leipzig in the 1880s uh, meant that the church did not dare to put up Mendelssohn's face in one of the windows. It wasn't until the 19... I don't know, about 2000 or 1990s, that they now have a Mendelssohn window in that church. And the idea that this glorious music and the, uh, the contributions that both these musicians have made to our Western tradition of fabulous music um, is represented and, and with the awareness of the anti-Semitism which can tear apart even wonderful gifts and talents like those. Thank you, Tim, for that celebration and for the truth through music. We give thanks. God, in your grace, receive our prayer. I just wanted to kind of reiterate, um, I live in a senior housing, and a dear friend of mine, uh, she's African-American, and... She came to me the next day after the elections, and she said, she was shaking, and she said, I'm going to be put in a cage. And I didn't know exactly how to answer her, except that we need to pray that hate can be transferred to love. So I hope that we all can do that. Thank you. We amplify Reverend Maggie's prayer. God, in your grace, receive our prayer.
My name is Linda, and I guess this started out as a concern, and I'm hoping it's moving towards celebration, but I told several friends on Wednesday that my word of the day was foreboding. And if you look that up, it's fear and uncertainty and anxiety about what's coming. And then, as the week went on, I moved on to resistance and finally persistence. So I'm celebrating that. Linda, we join that celebration and prayer. God, in your grace, receive our prayer. My name's Anita, and this is Holly. You met earlier. We have uh, both a celebration and a concern. Our celebration, the happy part, is um, our neighbor who is 100 years old this week. We got to celebrate with her. So we had a wonderful time of sharing stories and celebrating with our neighbors um, this week, which is really wonderful. That's our friend Josie, who just turned 100. Our concern is uh, that, um, I have to read my notes. Um, this week, a longtime friend of mine, who I've known over 50 years, suddenly and unexpectedly died. Her name is Carol Johnson, and I introduced her to Reverend Judy Arnold, who used to work at this church, and they were married. And um, uh, so um, Judy was at Carol's bedside when they um, let her pass. Carol's two sisters were there from upstate New York. And it's uh, a terrible, sudden, unexpected loss for our friendship group and for many other people. So we ask for your prayers for all of us. Thank you. Holly and Anita, we hold the two of you in our hearts and in our prayers in this seismic loss. We hold Judy as well. We ask that God's light perpetual would shine and comfort be and a welcoming home for Carol and for uh, your, your grieving to be held in the palm of God's hand uh, as you walk dogs. You have been there with, with them both the past several days. So your exhaustion, I know, is uh, magnified. So we pray for the two of you, and we give thanks for Josie's 100 years young birthday. God, in your grace, receive our prayer. And can I ask you to look to our onliners to see if there are prayers? If anyone either. would like to um, say a prayer in person, if you could raise your hand, then you can speak. And while you're considering that, I want to share um, a request for prayers. Christine James asked for, for her and her husband, Guy, as they're just having the first few days after having to say goodbye to their remaining ram, Finn, who died yesterday after a long illness. There was nothing the vet could do. Sorry. Um, so Finn is now joining his brother, Huck, who died earlier this spring. And it was just a hard loss in a hard week. They will miss seeing their handsome creatures in the homestead paddocks. So we pray with love <laughs> surrounding Christine and Guy, and everyone else who has animals all around the world who mean so much. And when they, we lose them, it, it affects us, but we know that that love continues, and so we give thanks for that. God, in your grace, receive, receive our, prayer. our prayer. Does anyone else have a prayer? Okay. Oh, yes, Christine, please unmute. Right. I know, on phones, you're still not muted yet. I mean, you're still muted. It's hard on a phone. There you go. Yes, I'm asking for prayers for my friend Peter, who was just uh, diagnosed with uh, 
inoperable terminal cancer. Christine, we pray with you. We pray for Peter, for everyone around him, for his medical team, for everyone who loves him, for everyone's affected by him. May he be held, may he feel God's spirit filling and surrounding. God, in your grace, receive, receive our, our prayer. I think that's all. Thank you, Diane. I asked one other prayer for a beloved family member of mine who recently had a fall and a concussion, so prayers for her healing. God, in your grace, receive our prayer. Friends, I know there are other prayers that we carry with us, especially this week, so I'd ask us to take those silently, lift them into the prayer that Nancy we will, now, will now lift for us in solidarity. Lord, listen to your children praying. What a time this is. We, like Esther, have heard some very bad news. Like Mordecai, we feel like tearing our clothes and running through the streets wailing. Like Martin Luther, we see a flood of mortal ills. And like Fosdick, we cry out to be saved from the evils that surround us. We lament. We cry out that things are not okay that there is a vast gulf between the world we see and the world you, God, created and named good. But we hardly know how to say those things. All we know how to do is fast and pray and gather in these spaces together in silence with sighs too deep for words. And then to name the things that are on our hearts. Our rejoicing at the beautiful music we have to listen to and participate in. For opportunities to worship, to tell stories. For friends and long life. For the strength to persist but we also bring here and name the people who are hurt and fearful and facing illness and grieving. Send us a balm in Gilead and grant us the wisdom to know it when we see it. Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is different from what's written in your bullet, and I would love choir members to come forward to help us sing. And so we're going to have to remember some lines. This is not... And unfamiliar, which means this is a familiar song. Uh, ain't going to let nobody turn me around. Uh, we're going to try to sing this as we can today. So I'd invite you to rise if you are willing, um, if, or if that's comfortable to you, uh, on your feet or in your heart as we try to sing this together. The words uh, are not printed anywhere. You're going to listen <laughs> to the choir as we sing. The first is ain't. Gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around. It goes on. Keep on walking, keep on talking, walking into freedom land. That's the number one. I'm gonna read them out just so we got them. The second one, Jordan River is chilly and cold. We will cross it, we will cross it, cross it into freedom land. The last one, we've gotta fill our hearts with courage and love. We will rise up, we will rise up, rise up into freedom land. And I gotta say, Pete Seeger, what did he have on his banjo? This machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody.
started Turn me around Keep on walking Keep on talking Walking into freedom land Well, the Jordan River is chilly and cold Chilly and cold Chilly and cold Well, the Jordan River is chilly and cold We will cross it We will cross it Cross it into freedom land Hearts with courage and love We've got to fill our hearts with courage and love, courage and love, courage and love. We've got to fill our hearts with courage and love. We will rise up, we will rise up, rise up into freedom land. Last one, ain't nobody. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Keep on walking, keep on talking, walking into freedom land. Amen, amen. I have last minute invited Rabbi Michael to come forward to help send us off with a, with a blessing today. Thank you very much. Good morning. Shalom. I want to thank uh, my friend, Reverend Rob, for his welcome this morning and for your welcome. Delighted to be here on this morning. It's been quite a week, and certainly the theme of our service this morning has reflected the concerns, but also the celebrations and the acts of uh, resistance that our biblical forebears took seriously. I was obviously sitting in the very right seat this morning because right opposite me, on that window, and of course all of the windows illuminate the light that comes into this church, but it's framed by the words um, that actually we read this week on Shabbat, the words of Abraham and Sarah. It says, by faith, Abram went forth whither he knew not. We don't know where we're going, but we're going together, and we're walking that path. And hopefully all of us take seriously, but also with joyful thankfulness and gratefulness for the beauty of this morning, of this church, and of this music, these words, these people. We conclude our services in the synagogue with the ancient words of the priestly benediction. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmarecha. May God bless us all and keep us. Ya'er Adonai Panavelecha Vichuneka. May God's light, God's light of countenance, shine upon us. Isa Adonai Panavelecha Vichemlecha Shalom. May God turn to us, to all of us, to all who are welcome in kindness, and give us all peace, peace of heart, peace of mind, peace of soul. Amen. Feel free to unmute, maybe turn on your camera and say peace. Peace to all of you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.